The scriptures tell us that with Satan bound in the abyss, there will be no more deception on earth. How wonderful. Satan's powers of deception. That means that we'll all know the truth. We'll all know the deception. We will have So welcome everybody. We are study 20 in our study through the book of Revelation. And we're up to Revelation chapter 20. And the title I've given to this particular study is The Judgment of Satan. The Judgment of Satan. And of course in our previous study, we looked at the appearance of heaven's king, and it was one of my favorite studies. Uh, I really enjoyed teaching that. Some, there's some studies that you, you, you get into, it's just so enjoyable. And there's others that you, 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 have, to, you have to teach the truth. And, and some, there are some truths that, that uh, a preacher uh, not has difficulty with, but but knows that this is going down like a bomb. Do you know what I mean? There's some that is just hard to hear and yet must be spoken of by the one that will stand before God one day and give an answer to everything that's come forth from his lips. I'm speaking of myself. I know that one day I will stand before the Lord and, and he'll ask me, what did you do with the truth that I gave you? the light that I put within you. And I so want to be faithful on that day, and I'm sure you do too. So the Apostle John, in our last study, described the marriage supper of the Lamb and the bride of Christ. But we also read of the defeat of the beast and the false prophet who had waged war against the Lamb and his armies. So in chapter 20, John now continues in his narrative. Remember, the, the chapter divisions, the chapter separations, wasn't put in until a thousand years after this book was written. So I believe it should be a follow-on, and we know that because the first word in this chapter is then. Then I saw an angel. So in this study, we'll see... Four significant themes in this chapter as John describes what he sees. He's writing down what the Lord gives him and he's writing what he's seeing. So we will also, in this study, we'll also look at what the prophet Isaiah had to say about the rule and reign of the Messiah, the Lord Jesus. And uh, that part will be, what will the millennium be like? So let's, let's look, first of all, at uh, the five categories. The binding and removal of Satan, first of all. The reign of the saints with Christ in his kingdom on earth, number two. Then number three, what will the millennium be like? Big question, right? And then number four, the release of Satan for a short while on earth... And then number five, the great white throne judgment. So God willing will uh, we'll clarify on these, these topics. So number one, the binding and removal of Satan. Verse one, are you with me? Revelation 20, verse one. Then I saw an angel. Notice the beginning word, then. I saw an angel coming down from heaven with the key to the abyss holding in his hand a great chain. He seized the dragon, that ancient serpent, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. And he threw him into the abyss, shut it, and sealed it over him, so that he could not deceive the nations until the thousand years were complete. After that, he must be released for a brief period of time. Revelation 20, verses 1 to 3. So, uh, after losing 
the battle over Jerusalem. Remember, we looked a little while ago uh, about Zechariah chapter 12 that talks about God gathering all nations to Jerusalem where there will be a battle. I won't go into that. Satan is seized after losing that battle uh, by an angel. Unfortunately, we don't know who this angel is. But it could be the Archangel Michael. Why? Because he is the one that's the Archangel of Israel. He watches over the nation of Israel. And he is the one that Satan battled and lost in the war in the heavenly realms when he was thrown down. Remember that passage in uh, Revelation 12, verses 7 to 8? Let me read it to you. Then war broke out in heaven, and Michael and his angels, the archangel Michael, and his angels fought against the dragon. And the dragon and his angels fought back. But he was not strong enough, and they lost their place in heaven. So notice in verse 2, we have four titles for Satan in this book of Revelation. He is referred to as Satan, the dragon, the ancient serpent, and uh, I've missed myself. He's the Satan, the dragon, the one defeated in a heavenly battle by Michael the archangel, but he's also called that ancient serpent, the devil. And when he talks about that ancient serpent, He's referring back to the Garden of Eden, that serpent that spoke. That was Satan, that ancient serpent. And his use of the word ancient is reminding us of who he was and what he did in the Garden of Eden. Whomever the angel is, he has a key as well as a great chain with which to bind Satan and throws him into the abyss. Now, the original Greek word, abusos, means a deep hole in the deepest part of the earth. This Greek word is also translated in Revelation 9-2 as the bottomless pit. Imagine, there is no bottom, there is no stand, there is no, nothing he can put his feet on. It is a bottomless pit and in complete darkness, I believe. Satan is chained and locked in the deepest part of hell for 1,000 years, Revelation 20, verse 7. The purpose of this arrest and incarceration is not his final judgment and his punishment. That is to come later, the scripture tells us. At this point... Before the thousand years starts, he is bound so that he can no longer deceive the nations until the thousand years are ended. So it leaves us a question. If we see Satan bound and thrown into a bottomless pit, where is he now? A lot of people believe that uh, Satan occupies a place called hell, but that is not according to the scriptures. And uh, many people picture him with a pitchfork and red horns and he's got a red tail and in our comic, uh, comics he's pictured like that. But no, I, I kind of think this, this angel was one that was a high up angel, an archangel until he fell. And we, we don't have time to go into that, but we... Uh, I, trust that I'll be able to do another study and go through the whole of uh, spiritual warfare where we get into such things. But scripture tells us that Satan walks around like a roaring lion. Have you ever thought about that? And he's seeking for someone to devour. He wants to eat us up, so to speak, not in a fleshly sense, of course. But he, he feeds on our fears, our horrors, our sins. 
These are all things that he feeds on. He's looking for someone to devour, 1 Peter 5 verse 8. Jesus defeated Satan legally on the cross and sealed his fate. But we do not yet see him bound. That is coming when Jesus comes at this, what we're talking about now. Scripture tells us that hell is a place reserved for the devil and his angels, Matthew 25, 41. That will be his ultimate destination and judgment. And after the white thr- great white throne judgment, which we'll also look at in a minute, he is thrown into the lake of fire. And we'll look at that in a bit. I believe that there are different degrees of punishment in that awful place called hell. Greater punishment for greater sins. You know, it's when Jesus spoke to Pontius Pilate before his crucifixion, he said to Pilate, you have no authority over me unless it has been given you from above. For this reason, he who delivered me up to you has the greater sin. Notice there's greater sins. Let's think about that a minute. The greater the level of influence one has, the greater the degree of accountability for that authority or level of coercion. For example, celebrities. We can think of all kinds of celebrities when we, when we explore this. There are celebrities who speak openly and corrupt the values of those who hear them and are swayed by things they do. They will be held for the responsibility that they have had. The greater the influence over people, the greater the accountability, and unless they repent and turn to the Lord, the greater will be their punishment. Anyone with more significant influence will have greater responsibility and therefore a greater reward or judgment. The same, the scripture says, is true for teachers and leaders. James 3 verse 1 tells us this. That's scary for a preacher. I'd better make sure I'm teaching the truth as much as I know of it. And I have endeavoured to seek the Lord and really wrestle with these things before teaching these things. Writer and teacher Charles Swindoll, Chuck Swindoll, comments about the degrees of punishment in hell. And he gives us these words, I quote, There will always be some who will have less divine input than others. Because that is true, I believe... There will be degrees of eternal punishment. Look closely at the words of Jesus, and we're still quoting him in the scriptures. Luke 12, 47 to 48. That servant who knows, this is Jesus speaking, that servant who knows his master's will and does not get ready or does not do what his master wants will be beaten with many blows. But the one who does not know and does things deserving punishment will be beaten with few blows. From everyone who has been given much, much will be demanded. And from the one who has been entrusted with much, much more will be asked. There's the scary part for a preacher or teacher. Let's understand that no one without Christ spends eternity in heaven. However, the specifics of how God handles those who are without Christ because they heard so little might very well be answered by the idea of degrees of punishment. So obviously this is not a topic uh, that is very popular today. There are the concept of rewards and punishment, but we're talking here about the punishment of Satan. 
reading this passage in Scripture. That's, that's what we're looking at. And we will look about the rewards in two studies' time as we get into chapter 22. So, uh, we are told there will be rewards as a direct result of what we have done with our resources, our time, our energy, our gifts, our talents that God has given us. The parable of the talents in Matthew 25 explains that. This does not only refer to worldly possessions, but also to information, the light and knowledge of the truth that's been given to us. There will be consequences directly associated with how we choose to live our lives. What we're talking about is the enemy, Satan, knows everything, yet he has decided deliberately to go about his work of destroying lives. And there are others who serve him that will be held to account because of the amount of light that they've received, the amount of understanding of the way this world is set up. And they choose, they deliberately choose to go Satan's way rather than God's way. So let's move on. The reign of the saints with Christ. John then saw two different sets of people ruling and reigning with Christ. Let's read it, verse 4. Then I saw the thrones and those seated on them had been given authority to judge. There's that word and which tells us there's two. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their testimony of Jesus and for the word of God. And those who had not worshipped the beast or its image and, have not, and had not received its mark on their foreheads or hands. And they came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. The rest of the dead did not come back to life until the thousand years were complete. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy are those who share in the first resurrection! Exclamation mark. The second death has no power over them, but they will be priests to God. We spoke about that in our last study. And of Christ, and will reign with him for a thousand years. Hallelujah. So believers in Christ are given authority to judge together with those who are beheaded for their testimony of Christ and have not worshipped the beast or his image. Paul the Apostle wrote about this, that there, was a, there is given to the church. And obviously Paul the Apostle wrote this 2,000 years ago. But he wrote, Do you not know that we are to judge angels? Did you realize that? The scripture teaches that there will come a time when believers in Christ, those that have walked with him, will judge angels. And obviously he's not talking about the good angels that have stuck with the Lord. He's talking about the bad angels that threw in their lot with Satan. We don't have enough time to go there. Both parties of believers receive new bodies at the first resurrection, also known as the rapture. Uh, we can read about this incorruption, this incorruptible body that is given to us in 1 Corinthians 15. We don't have enough time to go there at the moment. But both sets of believers will reign with Christ at his return. They will be priests ruling and reigning in God's kingdom in a marriage relationship, which is what we looked at last week, as the bride of Christ during this time of peace for a thousand years. Now, theologians and scholars call this thousand years reign of Christ the millennium. The word millennium means a thousand, simple, simple enough. There are three beliefs about the millennium. 
The first is called amillennialism. Get your tongue around that. <laughs> An amillennialist believes that the thousand years mentioned six times in Revelation 20, verses 2 to 7, is not a literal number, but a symbolic number representing the time that we are in now, the church age. I won't go there. I don't give much credence to that, because in my mind, we're living in the kingdom age now, and Satan is down there in the, in the bottomless pit already. To me, that doesn't seem logical, but some people believe that that is uh, what the millennium is. Secondly, there is post-millennialism. <laughs> post also believe that the 1,000-year period mentioned in the passage above is not a literal 1,000 years. In their view, the church will bring in a golden age of Christian ethics and Jesus' second coming will come after that period. Again, I do, not, I do not believe that myself, but there are some that hold to that theory. Are we seeing a golden age? In the 1800s, many held to this thinking that the church, now that we were sending, Britain especially, was sending out many missionaries to India and China, and, and we were going to bring in this golden age of Christian ethics. But now, in 2024, uh, there's not many people that hold to that because the world is getting darker and darker, and we... the the, the, the Evidence is staring us in the face. So there are not so many people nowadays that hold to that second view of our millennium. So, thirdly, there is premillennialism, <laughs> to which I hold this view. A premillennialist believes that the coming of Jesus will be after a time of tribulation and that he will raise or resurrect the saints, i.e. those who have been born again of the Spirit. The saints will rule and reign with him in a literal thousand-year reign on the earth and there will be no more war until the thousand years are up. And then Satan must be released for a time, verse 7 of the chapter we're looking at. And of course, there are differences of opinion uh, as to premillennialists, as, as in the pre-rapture, the mid-rapture, the post-rapture. So we won't get into that. We've looked at that before. So let me give you a question for you to ponder the, over these things. Imagine what our world will be like with Satan bound and unable to influence the world at all. How will the world be different when it is free from the influence of Satan, with him bound and unable to deceive? Give you a few minutes to think through that and go for it. So let's look now at what will the millennium be like? Big question. And we don't have a huge amount of information, but we have some info about that period of time. For those who are believers, our new resurrection bodies will have no more temptation towards sin and evil. The scriptures tell us that with Satan bound in the abyss, there will be no more deception on earth. How wonderful. Amen. Satan's powers of deception. That means that we'll all know the truth. We'll all know the deception. We will have light and understanding about God and the war that's been going on on earth for centuries. Light will come to all men living on earth at that time. 
our glorified resurrection bodies will take away all fear of harm or death. When Jesus returns, the scriptures tell us, the saints will be immortal. Let me read to you 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 53. For this perishable body, this is Paul writing, for this perishable body must put on the imperishable. And this mortal body must put put on immortality. In other words, you can't be killed or put to death. There will be no more fear, etc., etc. Because believers in Christ will be operating in a free capacity, the creativity of all God's people, the saints, will be unleashed. We will likely see our bodies, our souls and minds working at a completely different level. At the moment, they say that we only use 10% of our brain power. So with, with complete change and with an immortal body, the mind boggles at what uh, the person that is walking with Christ in their immortal body, what that will be like. We will be free from constraint and we will finally experience life as God intended. Also, what an awesome world this earth will be. Because the whole creation is waiting for the time when those who are in Christ will put on incorruptible bodies. Verse 54 of chapter 1 Corinthians. And there will be a change in the nature of the animal kingdom. Paul also writes elsewhere in the book of Romans these words, verse 19 of Romans 8. The creation, what does he mean by the creation? The creation waits in eager expectation for the sons of God. He's talking about sons and daughters, of course, those walking with Christ, the sons of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the glorious freedom of the children of God. We know, Paul carries on, verse 22, we know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Oh, the mind boggles at that scripture. When Paul wrote that, those words to the Romans... I I wonder what was on his mind. I believe that he was referring to the animal kingdom, the creation, the birds, the animals, etc., which is so fearful of humankind at present. It is sad, isn't it, that animals, as soon as they see a human, they run in the opposite direction. Of course, some animals don't. (laughs) We don't want to tangle with those ones. But as as an inclination that is deep within their beings, they are frightened of mankind until we we actually gain their trust. And I don't know about you, but my family loves to watch animal videos of people doing wonderful things to help the animals in different situations. But even then, when, when they're released from traps or tied up in fences and tied up with barbed wire and everything, and a human being comes along and sets them free, they still run away. It's not as if they come up to you and lick you all over the face in thankfulness. No, there's this fear that's within them, this natural inclination. But that will be changed, brothers and sisters, at the coming of Christ, and I believe this millennium, this time of the millennium. Since the fall, the relationship between humanity and the 
animal kingdom has suffered. And today we see the devastating effects of modern agriculture and livestock farming methods that bring suffering to the creation. Oh, if you doubt that, just... Oh, there are videos out there. Food Inc. Anyone ever seen Food Inc.? I think it's on Netflix. It will upset you, but open your eyes to how animals are treated in our modern day farming. This treatment of the animal kingdom is not what God intended and animals are suffering and longing to be released from this inhumanity that we have towards the animals. The inner longing and groaning of all the animal kingdom are for the change of their nature of fear toward humanity and one another. When Jesus comes and the millennium begins, there will be significant changes to the animal and bird kingdom and all of God's creation. Oh, I would just love to stroke the mane of a lion or or hold a bird in my hand and just stroke it. We we all have that natural inclination to, like a, a fawn or... Or oh dear, I would love to go up and stroke them and just invite them into the house. Wouldn't that be cool? And some people do do that. <laughs> Let me read to you what Isaiah chapter 11, I think is talking about the millennium again. Verses 1 to 10, Isaiah 11. Verse 1, a shoot, we'll, we'll come back to that in a minute. A shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. Who was, who was Jesse? David's father, King David's father, was named Jesse. A shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse, from his roots, a branch. Notice it's capitalized. You, you, know, you get who we're talking about. A branch will bear fruit. The spirit of, the, of Yahweh, the spirit of the Lord, will rest on him. The spirit of wisdom and of understanding, the spirit of counsel and of power, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. And he will delight in the fear of Yahweh. He will not judge by what he sees with his eyes or decide by what he hears with his ears. But with righteousness, he will judge the needy With justice he will give decisions for the poor of the earth. He will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, with the breath of his lips. He will slay the wicked. Righteousness will be his belt and faithfulness the sash around his waist. The wolf will live with the lamb. The leopard will will lie down with the goat. The calf and the lion and the yearling together. And a little child will lead them. Oh, there's my dream, walking along with the lion. A little child, trusting your kids to walk with the lions and be stroking them. Frightening at the moment, but God says, this time will come, brothers and sisters. Let's carry on reading. The cow, verse 7, the cow will feed with the bear. Their young will lie down together and the lion will eat straw like the ox. The infant will play near the hole of the cobra and the young child put his hand into the viper's nest. They will neither harm nor destroy on all my holy mountain. For the earth will be full of the knowledge of Yahweh as the waters cover the sea. In that day, what day? The day when the Lord Jesus sits upon his throne, I believe that's talking about. In that day, the root of Jesse, obviously the Lord Jesus, will stand as a banner for the peoples and the nations, the Goyim, the Gentiles, the nations will rally to him And his place of rest will be glorious. Don't you want that? That rest of the Messiah, the Sabbath rest of the Messiah, the thousand-year 
reign of the Lord Jesus Christ. Notice the changes that take place when Christ is on the throne. Animals that are opposites to one another will feed alongside one another. Verses 6 and 7. The wolf and the sheep will lie down with one another at night. Can you imagine that, watching that, seeing that? These animals that at the moment they fight and kill one another as, if, as, as much as they could. They will live in the same habitat. The lion, one of the most predatory animals on earth, will eat straw in the same way an ox does. Verse 7. Then there will be children reaching into the dens of adders and playing with venomous snakes. More than 600 years before Christ, when Isaiah's prophecy was spoken, ferocious animals were abundant in Israel. Not so anymore. Still, Isaiah prophesies a time when children will play with the animals and the earth will be at peace. Isaiah prophesied that because the knowledge of God will cover the earth, the Goyim, the Gentile nations, will place their trust in the Son of David. Remember, when he wrote this, there was such an animosity by the Jews towards the Gentiles. The two never came together, and, and the Spirit of God coming in the day of Pentecost changed all of that when Gentiles and Cornelius and Acts chapter 9 was brought into the kingdom of God and the spirit of God went to the Samaritans. The, the hated Samaritans? They couldn't believe it when they heard that the Samaritans had received the spirit. And it boggled their mind when they heard that the Gentiles, Cornelius, the centurion, were all filled with the spirit. Things were changing. Prophecy was being heard and answered. Yes, the earth will be covered with the knowledge of the Lord. And it will be the seven Sabbath rest of a thousand years. God's presence and reign will accomplish this. So notice who will inaugurate this time of change. It is not the church, as we said earlier. Some people believe it's the church that will Christianize the world. It's not the church that will inaugurate this thousand-year reign of Christ. It is the Lord himself. We are told that a shoot will come up from Jesse's line, King David's father, Isaiah 11, 1. And a great king will come from the tribe of Judah and of David's descendants, one who will judge the earth. The Lord Jesus will not judge by what he sees or hears. He will judge difficult situations because he knows all and has perfect judgment about all things. Christ will rule and reign in righteousness. He has come to earth and suffered the worst that humanity and injustice could throw at him and has completely overcome for each of us. On our behalf, he went to the cross and said, I will go, Father. And he came and paid the substitutionary price of death for us and as us. The Lord is the one who has the power to speak and create with his words. With the breath of his lips, he will slay the wicked, verse 4. But who can endure the day of his coming? Malachi chapter 3, verse 2 says. Who can endure the day of his coming? Who can stand when he appears? For he will be like a refiner's fire or a launderer's soap. And as, my, as I shared last, uh, last uh, study, you know, before I came to Christ and I had that vision of the coming of Christ, oh, I was so terrified I, that I would be looking for a cave to hide myself. And thank God that he drew me with cords of love and, 
and brought me into his kingdom, not because of anything I've done that's good or anything, but because of what he has done. He is the substitutionary lamb slain before the foundation of the world, the scripture says. He was slain before he even God even brought all life into being. He was, the plan was already laid down to bring forth a body of people, the bride of Christ, that Christ will be married to, brought into a covenant, the new covenant spoken of by Jeremiah the prophet in chapter 31, verse 31. So let's have another question, give you a chance to think. Isaiah 11, 9 tells us that the earth will be full of, of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. So discuss what you think this verse means. How do you think the knowledge of the Lord will permeate the earth? How will the creation be affected? Go for it. Give you a few minutes to ponder those things. Let's now talk about the release of Satan for a short while on earth. Let's read Revelation 20, verses 7 to 10. When the thousand years are complete, Satan will be released from his prison and will go out to deceive the nations in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to assemble them for battle. Their number is like the sand of the seashore, and they marched across the broad expanse of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city. I think there's only one beloved city, and that is Jerusalem. But fire came down from heaven and consumed them. And the devil who had deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur into which the beast and the false prophet had already been thrown. There they will be tormented day and night, forever and ever. This passage about the devil is one of the more difficult ones to understand because we must ask ourselves, why would God plan to release Satan at this time before his ultimate judgment. To understand this question, we would, of course, have to know why God allowed Satan to have any influence over man at all. Because he could have stopped it all there in the Garden of Eden. He could have jumped in and stopped the serpent from tempting Adam and Eve. So what's, what's God's purpose? Have you ever wondered that? Why, God, would you let him go? Why don't you just destroy him and throw him in then into the lake of fire? Why allow him to exist at all? God created man and woman for relationship. He gave us free will to choose to follow and serve him. It is a choice that we all have whether we will love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul and strength or whether we will listen and obey ourselves. The consequence of this freedom is that God watches our choices. Every day, every hour, there is nothing that we do that is not seen by him. He knows all things. He sees all things, knows all things. This is a test of our character. This, while we walk this earth, we are in a test of our character. He is refining us. We don't, we don't see it. But he is like the, the potter and the wheel, as in Jeremiah 18, I think it is. Uh, the potter and the wheel, and, and the Lord took Jeremiah down to the potter, and, and what do you see, Jeremiah? And Jeremiah sees this uh, man making a pot, an earthenware vessel, and, 
It's gone wonky, as we say in England. It's gone skewiff. There's another English word. <laughs> it's a mess, and he takes it off of the wheel, spins that wheel, and throws it on again, and starts afresh. And the lesson that that God was given Jeremiah, can I not do this with the house of Israel? And he's showing him that God is the potter and he is using our lives as a way of testing us, refining us, creating us anew, challenging us. All life is a test of our character. And one day, at the end of our lives, there will be a stamp of approval on the bottom of your vessel, so to speak. We are earthen vessels, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 talks about. We are all earthen vessels that God is shaping and creating us anew, making us into a glorious image. And at the moment, we can't see what God is doing, but there will come a day when he will show us. When this life is over and we, we look at the what's on the inside will come to the outside. And we will marvel at that time. Light will come to us. We will understand what God has been doing and how he is refining us, challenging us, and he's even using Satan in that means. Are oh, we don't like to think about that, but the enemy is under the hands of our almighty God and he's using him and the things that he does as a means of transforming us, metaschematetso, changing us, conforming us into the image of Christ. The test of our character is a great mystery and one that we'll only truly understand when we know the Lord as we are known. Paul tells us that that one day we shall see him face to face. 1 Corinthians 13 verse 12 tells us this. For now we see only a reflection as in a mirror. And remember, mirrors at that time was just burnished bronze, polished up. So it was a very poor reflection. That's what he's getting at. Mirrors today are totally different. But he's saying, look, we only see this poor reflection of things at the moment, but then, what do we mean by then? When Christ comes and our incorruptible body is given to us, then we shall see face to face now I know in part, then I shall know fully. Oh, what a wonderful time that will be when we will fully understand all the mysteries that are at the moment hidden from us and partly because of Satan's deception. Then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known by the Lord Jesus. My view is that there will be two kinds of people alive on earth during the thousand year millennium. There will be the body of Christ, the saints of the living God, but there will also be those who never came to Christ and are still alive when Christ returns with his angels and the saints living on earth. So, Satan will be released after the thousand years are up, and he will go forth to deceive the nations all over the world. If it is only the saints living on the earth, how can the saints be deceived in the new bodies? I don't think he's talking about the saints, because those that are still living on earth will be deceived as Satan is let loose from his place in the abyss. It will not be the saints. These ones gather against God's people. God allows a time of choice again when the thousand years are up. Furthermore, Isaiah prophesied a time when people would live to a great age. And I think it's talking about those that are not believers, that are not saints, that do not have a fully resurrected, incorruptible body 
Let me read to you. Isaiah 65, verse 20. Never again will there be in it an infant who lives but a few days or an old man who does not live out his years. The one who dies at a hundred will be thought a mere child. The one who fails to reach a hundred will be considered accursed. In other words, he's saying that those who are not believers will live to great age, just like just like Adam. He lived more than 800 years, and many in those, those days lived hundreds of years. I wonder whether it will become similar to that as, as mankind has changed. Some will not join in the Antichrist war at the last battle over Jerusalem. We're talking about Zechariah 14. Uh, where it talks about the last battle will be over Jerusalem. They will still be left when the millennium begins. They will still be subject to death. Death and Hades are only destroyed at the end of the millennium. Verse 14 tells us that. We are told that when Satan is released for a short time, he will deceive those born during the thousand years and motivate them to make one last attack on the saints and the beloved city. There is only one beloved city, Jerusalem. The city of peace, the city that God has set apart for himself. Fire from God will come down upon those who attack the saints. And at this point, Satan will join the Antichrist and the false prophet in the lake of fire, because the angel will grab a hold of him and throw him in the lake of fire, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. This great white throne judgment signals the end of all evil. So let's talk about that now. The great white throne judgment. Verse 11. Then I saw a great white throne... And the one seated on it, earth and heaven, fled from his presence. And no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne. And there were open books. And one of them was the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their deeds as recorded in the books. The sea gave up its dead, and death and Hades gave up their dead. And each one was judged according to his deeds. Revelation 20, verses 11 to 13. So at the end of the thousand years of peace, and with all God's enemies overcome, then will come the great white throne judgment with books opened with the records of all deeds. It will be a fearful and awesome thing to stand before the living God and give an account for one's motives and one's deeds. The writer of the letter to the Hebrews writes, it is a dreadful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Hebrews 10 31. And if you are not yet walking with Christ, this is a good time to do it. Along with records of all deeds, another book will be opened called the Book of Life. Thank God for this book. This book has the names written of all who choose Christ and receive a pardon for their sins and new life in Christ. May your name be found written in that book. Jesus talked about this book, the book of life, with his disciples when he sent them out two by two to all of Israel's cities. Luke chapter 10, verse 20. They came back to him rejoicing that they had power and authority over evil spirits. But he replied to them, however, do not rejoice that the spirits submit to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. I trust that your name is written in heaven. 
When a person commits their life to Christ, their sin is forgiven, there is repentance, a turnaround, and he enters into a covenant relationship with God and their names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. We also read about the Book of Life when we looked at the Antichrist deception and the war against the saints. During that time, the Antichrist's war against God's people will force people to decide which side they're on. All those who are on the Lord's side will not worship the Antichrist and Satan. Here's what it says, Revelation 13, 8. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are all, and all, and it's talking about the Antichrist, of course. And all that will dwell upon the earth shall worship him, the Antichrist, whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Brothers and sisters, you must make your choice. Some of you, are maybe on the video, have not yet made that choice. You still hang in the balance. You wonder if your name is written. Are you sure that you have given your life to Christ and are walking with him? Religion doesn't cut it, brothers and sisters. It's not how good you are. It's not climbing a ladder of good works, trying to make it to heaven. No, there is one who's come down from heaven and paid the penalty for all your sins so that he can give you the gift of God, which is Life in Christ, eternal life in Christ. We also read about that book. You must make your choice. Revelation 20, verses 14 to 15. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone was found whose name was not written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. We are all faced with a choice, similar to Joshua 24. Whom will you choose? Who, 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 is, who do you walk with? When we choose Christ, we choose life eternal. It is a far cry from the world in which we live, this kingdom of heaven that we will one day see and walk in. I hope that you can allow yourself to dream about life as God intended. Brothers and sisters, this is not a fairy tale. These are eternal truths I present to you. And I trust that you will choose life rather than death. We see longings of a better life in all the excellent fancy, fantasy tales of... We, there's always there's something within us tells us that there's something, something more. This life that we live is not all there is. There is something beyond death we call eternity, and I trust that you are heading the right way. Deep down, we know that we were created for a different life, something for what C.S. Lewis called our inconsolable longing. One day, God will answer our cries, our inner longings, and everyone who calls on the name of the Lord and whose name is found in the book of life will find fulfillment in the life that God has prepared for those who love him. Before his crucifixion, Jesus said these words, Do not let your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions, different translations, Talk about dwelling places, mansions, dwelling places with God. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. 
And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. John also assures of the, us of the future. He said these words. Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, because we shall see him as he is. 1 John 3, 2. We can rest in his love and what he has prepared in the future for us. Let's stand and we'll pray. Father, thank you that you hold everything in your hands. Your plans are set from the foundation of this world. And you exist in the past, present and future. You are the great I am. Thank you, Father, for choosing us before the foundation of the world. We declare that your kingdom has no end. Amen. And if you've not yet made that decision, I invite you to pray this prayer. Father, would you receive me to yourself? I invite you, Lord Jesus, to come into my life. I, I repent. I turn around from uh, my vain life to receive you. I receive the full forgiveness that you have promised for my sin and I receive you today as Lord and Master of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. God bless you. See you next week.